Good evening, friends. I'm back after a gap of one day. Today, I've come with a surgical topic that is tackling difficult fibroids at myomectomy. As you all know, myomectomy is the one of the commonest surgeries that is done in gynecology. It may be probably the third commonest after cesarean and hysterectomy. So I have some videos also to show in this particular talk. Uh, obviously, the myomectomy done by me only. So, I hope you enjoy this talk as well as the videos. I put the title as Tackling Difficult Fibroids at Myomectomy because these questions are sometimes asked in the exams, especially with regards to some special type of fibroids. And a postgraduate must know about it. Even for a practicing gynecologist, uh, I will be giving some tips as to how to tackle the difficult fibroids. As you know, leomyoma comes under what is called AUBL. In palm coin, it is L. But then there is a subclassification of leomyoma, and that subclassification is nothing but zero means pedunculated intracavitary, as you can see here. And one is more than, less than 50% intramural, more than 50% is intracavitary. Two is more than 50% intramural. Three is totally almost intramural, but just contacts the endometrium, 100% intramural. And fourth is, of course, there is no contact with the endometrium at all. When you come to number five, actually here, if you can see, it is subserous in both places, but 50% is intramural. Whereas number six is subserous, more than 50% is outside, as you can see here. And uh, number seven is almost pedunculated subserous, and number eight is others. You can specify them as either cervical fibroid or a parasitic fibroid and things like that. So this was actually the old classification. Now I'm going to tell you the new classification in the sense modification or addendums to the same classification, which was brought in in September 2018. So what are these new addendums to already existing zero to eight? This is very important. That's why I'm talking about this before going on to my mectum. Inclusion of type 3 as a submucus. What you could see here is type 3 is 100% intramural, but it just contacts endometrium according to old classification. But even though it is just contacting endometrium, it is included as submucus. Now, what is the surgical importance of this? Surgical importance of this is because it is purely intramural, we may tackle it like an intramural fibroid. But why they have made it like a submucus? They have made it submucus because it may affect fertility, especially if it is on the implantation site. So that's the reason probably it is also classified as submucus. The other problem what they have done is that the distinction between types 0 and 1, 0 is almost intracavitary and that is pedunculated and 1 is also almost and 6 and 7, as you can see here 6 is almost subserous and this is pedunculated subserous based on the stock diameter. Now, zero will have a thinner stock, seven will have a thinner stock, but number one and number six, they are almost like sesen. sesen. So that means the stock will be broader. So that's why we have to probably treat them differently. If it is zero, a beautiful stock will be there and you have to just clamp that stock or you can cut that stock and entire thing will come out. Same story for the number seven. <coughs> Put a clamp and cut and remove it. Whereas if it is one and six, they are almost like sessile. 
it may be very difficult to just put a clamp there. You have to scoop through them. That's why they have to make a distinction between these types based on the stock diameter. Then between two and three, based on lowest filling pressure. Now two is like almost into the myometrium. Only little bit is in the cavity, but how much filling defect will be there or filling pressure will be there. Same story for three. Three is now categorized under sub mucus. That's what I said in the first, the bullet point there or first bubble. Again, how much filling pressure will be there based on that they are gonna gain. This is just of some academic importance. Maybe if you want to do some you know, studies and things like that, it will be very important. I don't see any big practical uh, importance of this. And finally, they have made a distinction between four and five based on distortion of serosa. Again, as you can see here, four is almost touching the serosa, whereas five is come out of serosa and how much the uterine shape is distorted. Again, it is of not much of an importance according to me, but every time when they meet, they have to classify, subclassify, probably they have to say something more. Probably that's the reason they have made, this is called like hair splitting. They have made, there is some importance is as far as the research is concerned or maybe other things are concerned, but I don't think a big practical importance is there, except maybe, uh, in this one, that is based on the stock diameter, this has got a very big impact. And this probably has an impact as a fertility uh, scenario, but these two, I, at least I have not understood clearly what is the reason why have they made such hair splitting distinctions. Anyway, this is very important for the postgraduates to know and answer in the exams. Nice to know. Now I come to the topic proper, that is uh, myomectomy. All of you know this. It's, as I said, uh, this is the probably first surgery that a postgraduate will be given in the training because uh, here there are not many things to be done. Open the abdomen and then you identify the fibroid. And because fibroid is a uh, entity which has got a nice pseudo capsule, it's very easy to tackle them. It's Removal of myomas or leaving by leaving behind the uterus is called myomectomy. All of you know that. It is possible because as I just now said, there is a pseudo capsule. You have to incise the capsule and you can just nicely enucleate it. That is the word. Like, you know, a nice orange, the Kurg orange, I would say, not the kiwi orange, which has got the tight skin. The Kurg orange, which has got a loose skin. And some people you can just put in the hand and just remove and rejoin the skin of the orange. So it's less like scooping out the orange from that. If you are in the right plane of cleavage, beautifully it comes out even without any bleeding as such. What are the indications for myomectomy? Obviously, younger age is an indication where you do not want to remove the uterus, married or unmarried. Then, married, but let's say she's infertile, you can't afford to lose the uterus and or she's low paras. She had that one child. She wants to have one or one more or maybe two more. Wishing to retain uterus. I know a lady who was almost like 40, 42. Still, she wanted to keep the uterus. She had two children, but we have to respect the choice of the patient. So we cannot do hysterectomy. We have to do myomectomy or some other uh, non-surgical techniques, which I'm going to tell in the end of the talk. Are there any contraindications for myomectomy? I mean, this may sound, when the question is asked, you may find what could be the contraindication. Yes, there is one contraindication in modern uh, gynecology that is sarcomatous change suspected. Then it is better to do hysterectomy. As you know, sarcoma, you cannot really nicely remove that particular fibroid easily. The fibroid under, has undergone sarcomatous change. Uh, the plane of cleavage is lost as well as even otherwise, as a treatment, you cannot just do the myomectomy. You have to do hysterectomy and probably after that, you have to give radiotherapy as well as chemotherapy. There were some contraindications, at least when I was a PG and that was, uh, but no more. 
I want to tell you before I tell those. No more. They are not contraindications anymore. Pregnancy complicated by fibroid. I remember very well when I was an expert assistant. I was not a student at that time. I was probably assistant professor. One of the external examiners made such a big uh, drama in the exam hall because the student by mistake said, uh, I would remove the fibroid at the time of cesarean section. He, the external examiner, almost failed the student. Then uh, we all came to her rescue. The internal examiners came to her rescue. But now we know that it is a norm. We do remove fibroids at cesarean section. It is no more a mistake. But that day, it was really, really sad situation. The postgraduate was so scared till the results came. Azospermia was considered uh, a contraindication because that time the donor sperm was not that very easily uh, thought of. So, but now we know donor sperm can be done and myomectomy is not at all a contraindication. Finally, multiple fibroids. We have seen such beautiful pictures, videos where they have made a beautiful uh, garland of the fibroids. People have in the bonus textbook, I read, the, I used to love reading these kind of monograms during my postgraduate, I don't think anybody reads that now. There is a beautiful bonus myomectomy book, this thick book on just myomectomies, the original uh, book by the bonus himself. And in that, he has written some 360 or some odd fibroids were removed. So multiple fibroids is not a contraindication anymore. What are the prerequisites? These questions are asked. Today, actually, I'm going a little bit to very basic. Uh, the consultants who are listening to this talk may be getting bored uh, because these are the basics. Uh, I, I don't know what year students are now listening. Maybe first years are there, second years are there, third years are also there. So let me go with the basics first. That is uh, prerequisites. HB should be at least 10 gram per cent. This is true for any surgery that you do. Minimum 10 grams is best so that, you know, you are in a well-prepared uh, condition unless it's an emergency like ectopic where sometimes even with 3 grams, 4 grams we have opened. Otherwise, for an elective surgery, obviously myomectomy is an elective surgery unless it has undergone torsion. In that case, particularly, it would be a subserous fibroid with a peduncle and you can clamp it and remove it. So even then, uh, 10, gram hemogram, uh, 10 grams of hemoglobin is always better to have. Even then, even if the hemoglobin is 10, you don't know how much bleeding can occur during the myomectomy. Sometimes if you are in the wrong plane and sometimes if there are some additions and all those things, there can be heavy bleeding. And if there are multiple fibroids, you, know, you will be putting multiple incisions and bleeding will be more till you control that. So blood product should be kept ready. Other causes of infertility should be investigated. Don't think that myomectomy, uterus, Uterine fibroid is the only cause of infertility. For all you know, after myomectomy also, she may not conceive. And then you will know that, you will realize that the male factor was also there. So also maybe there is a simultaneous endometriosis. We all know that these things coexist. The adenomyosis, endometriosis, fibroid uterus, these are all known to coexist with each other and all of them can cause infertility. So you have to investigate for that. Otherwise, uh, you will be branded as a failure in spite of doing a beautiful myomectomy. Endometrial carcinoma, that's another coexisting thing. I didn't talk about this when I was talking about infertility, but as you age near 40, maybe let's say the fibroid uterus, you must rule out endometrial carcinoma because again, hyperestrogenism is the common factor behind all of them, whether it is fibroid, endometriosis, adenomyosis, and endometrial carcinoma. So it is mandatory you rule out endometrial carcinoma in every single case of fibroids, especially after maybe 30 years also, I can say. So the reproductive age group, if you consider 20 to 40, the first half, that is 20 to uh, 30 is okay, but 30 to 40 and onwards, you have to rule out endometrial carcinoma. Consent for hysterectomy should be taken. This you may find why. Yes, I know a very... Uh, very well, I know very well that one of my own uh, known persons in America, they did the you know hysterectomy at a very young age group because I think probably heavy bleeding happened and then to save the life of the patient, you have to sometimes resort to hysterectomy. So a consent has to be taken beforehand. Usually uh, we don't do this and patient also should be put to a lot of caveats saying that in the rarest of the rare cases, we may have to do something like the air hostess tell. 
in the unlikely event of we landing on the uh, you know water like that you know we we just listen to it and just forget about it something like that we have to uh, tell the patient it is very very unlikely that we will do hysterectomy but there is a chance especially i recently had a case uh, i'm going to show that case she was a, a sort of unmarried uh, lady 34 35 years but she had a very huge fibroid as the size of a big pregnant uterus uh, of 34 to 36 weeks i'm going to show that and uh, she was very very particular that you cannot be hysterectomy i want to get married and i want to have a child but still i had to convince her somehow saying that in the very very rare situation i may land up in doing hysterectomy sometimes such a big uterus uh, fibroid uterine fibroid you don't know where is the uterus and some things like that so sometimes you have you have to remove i remember another case one of my colleagues a huge fibroid he didn't remove uterus but entire endometrium came out with the fibroid so that is also of no use for fertility so all these things we have to really counsel the patient properly uh, not to scare the patient but just to be on the safer side but then every sentence should be uh, nicely couched by saying it's not going to happen but it can happen and then if you can give the that's what i have learned from my daughter that in uh, uh, MRCOG exams and all that, you have to tell the exact uh, percentages, what can happen, what may not happen, but how we are prepared for that. So in counseling, you should not only uh, scare the patient of the statistics with statistics, but also you should say, I have the, uh, you know, we have the facilities to tackle that. We can manage that. Don't worry. So like that, we have to uh, tell the patient. Preferably performed postmenstrually. That is obvious because in the premenstrual period, there'll be a lot of congestion in the pelvis. And when you put the incision on the uterus, there'll be heavy bleeding. And otherwise also there will be a lot of problems with while tackling the huge vessels, especially the uterine artery and all that. They'll be very, very dilated. They are, these are the feeding arteries. And just premenstrually, they'll be highly dilated and bleeding will be more. So these are what is called prerequisites. Then a famous question, both in theory as well as in practicals, is what are the principles of myomectomy? Prerequisite is one thing, principle is another thing. So what is the what are the principles? Number one is you should observe thorough hemostasis because we are putting an incision on the uterus. And you know uterus is highly vascular organ. So what you can do is before putting your knife on the uterine wall, you must take adequate precautions for hemostasis. And my favorite actually is this particular camp, bonus clamp. It has got four. And this will be a question in the instruments, in the exams, in the viva. And there's a particular way to put this. So the, the, the beak of it, it should be pointing downwards. And you should include both the round ligaments. And this should go at the level of the internal os, where the uterine artery takes sharp, turn upwards. So it comes from the sides at the internal loss, it takes upwards. So at that juncture only you have to put this clamp. So remember the beak should be pointing downwards and it should be at the level of internal os, including both the round ligaments. And whenever you put this clamp, you have to remember to release this every 20 minutes. Otherwise there will be, uh, you know, ischemic necrosis of the uterus. You can also clamp the ovarian arteries at the IP ligament. Both clamps should be released every 20 minutes again. This is like to prevent the anastomosis, uh, you know, at the level of the uh, fundus or the coronal region. These will prevent the bleeding coming from the blood supply coming from the ovarian arteries directly from the iota. So you are clamping both the uterine arteries as well as the ovarian arteries. And some of my colleagues, uh, they prefer to put a tourniquet at the level of internal loss. This is a bigger procedure. You have to be careful. You have to dissect the uh, bladder before you put this uh, tourniquet. Also, injecting diluted vasopressin. Honestly, it is an object for that, but doesn't matter. It's very diluted version. You can give this uh, to the patient. In fact, in laparoscopic myomectomy, we see vasopressin is being injected so generously and lavishly to make the uterus look absolutely white. I've seen that. So you can do any one of these methods to prevent heavy bleeding. 
The next principle is, of course, midline vertical incision, because as you can see here, all these are spiral arteries are they're coming at, they are all end arteries, and in the center, there's absolutely white. I have shown this white because there's almost a vascular area. So midline incisions will have minimal bleeding. Not only that, it is better to put the incision on the anterior abdominal, anterior uterine wall rather than on the posterior uterine wall because posterior uterine wall will attract additions with the intestines. Having said that, you know, in the uh, current practice, we don't hesitate to put the incision on the posterior wall as well. If the uterus, if the fibroid is so very obviously situated on the posterior wall. Minimum incisions uh, we have to put. If there are 10 fibroids, you don't have to put 10 incisions. You can minimize the incisions by doing what is called tunneling incision. Suppose there are two fibroids next to each other. You put one incision in between, pluck out from this side and pluck out from that side. So instead of putting two incisions, you can manage with single incision. That's the meaning of minimal incisions and tunneling incision. Avoid entering the cavity. This is very important, especially uh, you know, if you do not want to disturb the endometrium or in future, if you enter the cavity, this particular type of ut uh, uterus is going to rupture more easily in future. Sometimes it is not possible to avoid entering the cavity. Doesn't matter. You can always suture nicely. It is better to always inject a methylene blue into the cavity prior to the surgery, either using a Foley's catheter, small infant Foley's catheter, or even a leech Wilkinson, because that will tell you that you have entered the cavity when you see the blue lining of the endometrium. Also, it will help you, as I said, when you remove a large fibroid, if the endometrium is coming with the fibroid, you will easily recognize that and you can stop uh, peeling there and you can do a sharp dissection and leave behind the endometrium with the uterus and just remove the fibroids. If you don't demarcate the endometrium with the methylene blue prior to the surgery, that calamity can happen wherein along with the fibroid, you will be removing entire endometrium without your knowledge. So these are the principles of myomectomy. To continue with that, obliterate the dead space with multiple sutures. Obviously, when you remove such a big fibroid, there will be a big dead space at that dead space is a good uh, reservoir for collection of blood and uh, hematoma, and that will be a good nidus for infection and everything will break down. So you have to put multiple sutures to obliterate the dead space. Cover the uh, sutures, the raw areas with peritoneum with baseball sutures, if possible. Obviously in the upper segment, the peritoneum is very tightly, uh, you know, uh, adherent to the uterus. So it is difficult sometimes, but you have to minimize the exposure of the raw area. Plicate the round ligaments to maintain antiversion. This is especially to avoid the adhesions with the intestines, but it is not done anymore. When I was PG and maybe in the junior staff, after myomectomy, anterior wall incision, we used to plicate the round ligament so that uterus will be bent like that. It will not be exposed to the intestines, but it is not done anymore. Injectable broad spectrum antibiotics as a prophylaxis. The antibiotics has become so common nowadays that uh, uh, it, it, it looks superfluous to mention that it is one of the principles. We definitely give antibiotics after any surgery. And finally, uh, we can also consider tranexamic acid at least 24 hours to minimize the bleeding. As you know, tranexamic acid can stop the bleeding from anywhere, including the bleeding from the nose, bleeding from the ear, bleeding from the uterus. It can be given antenatally, intranatally, postnatally, anywhere postoperatively. So that's it. Now I come to the types of myomectomy. It depends upon the site, size, and type of fibroid. What do you mean by that? It could be a fundal fibroid. Accordingly, there's a different type of uh, myomectomy. It could be cervical fibroid. It could be submucous fibroid, broad ligament fibroid, pedunculated, non-pedunculated, and multiple fibroids. These are so many varieties. That's exactly why I thought of taking a class on this myomectomy itself. It's not just single entity. The other thing is the skill of the surgeon and facilities available also will determine what type of myomectomy you do. What I mean by that is whether you are going to do through a laparotomy, opening up the traditional way, or whether you are going to tackle it laparoscopically. Laparoscopically went into a little bit of controversy because of that particular case in America where 
there was a spread of sarcoma that's why morcellation was banned and uh, for the big uh, fibroids and but we know that dr prakash trivedi and all they do a very beautiful myomectomy even for a big fibroids in the endo bag with beautiful morcellation and then finally you can do the myomectomy of the submucous fibroids through hysteroscopy as well so the type of myomectomy depends upon again the site size type and the facilities and of course the skill of the surgeon i think i have time only for this uh, simple myomectomy today i will probably have to extend the class for tomorrow again in any time i may suddenly stop the class because the time limit is coming to an end in simple myomectomy we put a fanon steel incision as far as possible uh, up to 16 20 weeks we can tackle with the fanon steel incision but anything beyond that obviously you have to require you have to put a midline sub umbilical or even supra umbilical incision if fibroid is in the upper segment there is no need to incise the uv fold of peritoneum and push the bladder down only for the lower fibroids or exactly the cervical fibroid you have to do this the upper segment fibroids whether it is anterior or posterior you can directly put the incision incise the uterine wall obviously and pseudo capsule till myoma to get this exact feel how much to incise you have to do 128 myomectomies how many 128 i am joking obviously in other words you have to do many myomectomies to know exactly when to stop and the clue here i have already told is that when you see the white thing white myoma you stop there and that's a good plane of cleavage if you stop there then bleeding will be minimum you can beautifully and you can put your fingers all around and remove like the orange seeds that you remove from the orange skin so that is a trick hold the myoma with the myoma screw of course uh, this is one of the important uh, you know instruments that you have to do so that you can hold it in one hand and start enucleating the fibroids by separating it from the capsules if in right plane there is hardly any bleeding that's what i just now said sometimes you may use have to use the scissors to nip the adhesions in between may have to remove the fibroid from its base with sharp dissection towards the end last part it is tightly stuck so there probably you have to do a sharp dissection and cut it and separate it from the its base and until that time in fact sometimes even a finger dissection is good enough to remove the fibroids came out through tunneling incision of adjacent myoma that's what i told you two myomas are there one myoma you remove like this in this through this incision another myoma you remove like that so you came out through the tunneling incision you don't have to put many incisions for removing fibroids usually what we do is after hysterectomy for a fibroid sometimes with old age uh, patients we do hysterectomy for fibroid that is the time in the specimen the pgs can have a go with the incision and to try to do enucleation and all those you can practice there obliterate the dead space using series of sutures this is very 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 important for example this much is the dead space first obliterate here and then here and then here and finally like this so start from the base you have to put multiple layers in order to obliterate the dead space every time you squeeze and see whether there is any bleeding close the myometrium and cover with the peritoneum as i have already told you that release the clamp to check whether there is bleeding of course in between the myomectomy also you are releasing once in 20 minutes but towards the end of this all suturing you release the clamp squeeze the uterus and see whether there is bleeding or not some people don't want to squeeze and all that that's fine but it, it's gentle squeezing doesn't really harm suture the bleeding area suppose after releasing the clamp if you still find some sutures figure of eight or you can put the transverse sutures because vessels are coming like this you can suture like that close the abdomen in layers of course that's uh, that's uh, part of the operation i think uh, i should stop there uh, just giving you a sort of trailer what is coming up tomorrow difficult situations like huge fibroid cervical fibroid cervical fibroid polyp low posterior fibroids large fundal fibroid broad ligament fibroid submucous multiple and pregnancy with fibroids.